Hi everyone, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and I'm here at the European Society of Cardiology meeting, and I'm very excited to have two of my colleagues who I've met from Western AFib who presented the Castle HTX study yesterday. Um, this is Christian Soans and Philip Sommer, and the Castle HTX study is, is very, very exciting. But before I uh, go get into that, I really want to introduce the concept of atrial fibrillation and heart failure. And I like to say that there are really two big populations of patients with AFib, and the vast majority of patients with AFib can be treated slowly with reassurance and education. But there's this group of patients who have heart failure who, when they develop atrial fibrillation, can degenerate rapidly. And the Castle HTX study looked at uh, catheter ablation versus medical therapy in patients with advanced heart failure. So welcome. And Christian, why don't you tell us the uh, top line results and what, what, what you found? Yeah, thanks, first of all, for mentioning this special cohort of patients and stage heart failure, which is very important. The endpoint of the study was uh, a composite of death from any cause, or left ventricular assist device implantation and heart transplantation. Very hard, strong clinical endpoints, not the rate of rehospitalization or something like that. And catheter ablation was superior to medical therapy alone in, this, in terms of this composite endpoint. And that was driven by cardiovascular death and all-cause mortality as well, which shows and highlights the fact that you should always consider uh, atrial fibrillation, ablation in these end-stage heart failure cohort. And the findings were driven by the fact that we saw left ventricular reverse remodeling and the reduction of AFib burden in these patients. Tell me about how it came about. It's, a, it's, it's at your center, and, and who were these patients? Well, as, as one of the biggest centers for heart transplantations all over Europe, with a roughly 100 transplants per year, we had a lot of patients being referred to our center with the questions, are those patients eligible for a heart transplantation? So not all of our patients in our study were listed for a transplant, but all of them were admitted in an end-stage heart failure status to evaluate the eligibility of getting a transplant. And if you look at the baseline data of those patients, they had an ejection fraction of 29%. They had a six minute walk test so as a functional capacity parameter of around 300 meters. Like two thirds of them were in New York Heart 3 and 4, which is significantly worse than what we saw in the previous studies dealing with heart failure patients. So I think overall, if you also look at, at, at uh, anti pro P levels, a really sick patient population where some people might have doubts to admit those patients and refer those patients for an ablation procedure. And um, so therefore it's really interesting and fascinating to see what the result at the end of the day was. But I, I did read in the manuscript, and I think I heard from you that these were recruited, were they recruited as outpatients? So they were stable outpatients who were referred to the center for consideration of LVAD or transplant? I mean, the, the, the definition of stability is very difficult in these patients because they have hospital stays, they have a history of drug therapy, they have a history of interventions also behind them, not AFib ablation, but others. And um, I think these patients are referred because the, the, the referring physician or hospital, they are, they are done with the case, so they can no longer offer any other option to the patients instead of surgical treatment, assist device, pump implantation or transplantation. And if you look at the guidelines, they do not comment on AFib ablation in this cohort of patients. And also we have different recommendations between the American societies, the European societies, what is end-stage heart failure and how to treat these patients. And therefore it was a big, big, big benefit of CASAT HTX that we randomized a cohort of patients into advanced end-stage heart failure. These were very, very, very clinically significant findings, large effect sizes, very early separation of the Kaplan-Meier curves. How do you explain how, how dramatic an effect that is and how early of an effect? That's one of the key questions at the end of the day. I think uh, our job basically was to, to provide the data and to assure that the, the data is, is, is clean and that it's all uh, perfectly uh, uh, done. Um, the interpretation of this data is, is really kind of difficult. Also, we do not have the 100% the perfect and uh, obvious explanation why the curves actually separated so early. Our view on that is that we are talking about a pretty fragile patient population and little differences like having a tachyarrhythmia of 110 day in day out or being in sinus of 60 can make a huge difference. And that obviously 
pretty early. So the, the one that remains in tachyarrhythmia will deteriorate and will require an alvet after a couple of months. And the one that you may keep in sinus rhythm, even with reduced AF burden, not zero, but reduced AF burden, improved LV function, all of a sudden this patient will still remain on a low level of being stable, but he will remain stable and will not require um, any surgical intervention for the next one and a half, two years, obviously. And if we can manage to do this, like just postponing the natural course of the disease, I think that is a great benefit for the patient. I mean, one of the things that comes up in our center is I look at some of these patients and I'm like, there's no way I can put this patient under general anesthetic and do all of this, but your, your ablation procedure, and it, it, it wasn't that like extensive, was it? Uh, on the one hand, no. On the other hand, yes. I mean, you need to take into consideration that it has been performed by experienced physicians with experience in heart failure treatment and atrial fibrillation in a heart transplantation center. So it's not sure that we can transfer these results one to one to all other centers in the world. But it is very clear, we have almost no major complications in these patients. We were able to do these ablation procedures without general anesthesia. We have 60% of patients who have PVI only and 40% of patients who have PVI and additional therapy. And we have a procedure duration of almost 90 minutes doing RF ablation. Um, and we have different categories. And when you talk about the different patient cohorts, we also see um, different stages of myocardial tissue damage, um, which will be part of another publication for sure. But it is in part surprisingly how normal other atriums have been. And on the other hand, they have a volume of 180 milliliters, but they have no fibrosis. And if we talk about this, for example, that was very interesting. How did um, the, the persistent paroxysmal um, uh, sort out? Were these mostly persistent patients? Yeah, in the range of two thirds were persistent, which would be expected actually in this patient population that you do not find so many paroxysmals. Um, but I think it's uh, it's really important what, what what Christian was just mentioning that also when we discussed the trial design, we were in a in a way um, anticipating problems with the with the sedation, for example, or with the uh, with the um, uh, the follow up of those procedures. Would they decompensate because of the fluid that you have to deliver necessarily during such a procedure? But we were quite surprised at the end of the day that the procedures were quite straightforward. We fortunately had no major complications despite a couple of exercise complications. I think it was like four in the, in the whole, like 100 ablated patients. So I think we, are, we were really positive about the, the way the procedure actually ended. One has to mention maybe one of the exclusion criteria was an LA diameter above 60. So the real huge ones, maybe very, very diseased ones, and maybe in terms of an EP view, hopeless ones mm. um, were excluded from that study. But below 60, we did the ablation. One of, the, one of my colleagues uh, made sure that I asked you a question. Um, a skeptic, skeptic, even more than me, skeptical, <laughs> okay. uh, wanted me to ask you all, why wouldn't you just take a patient with persistent atrial fibrillation who had heart failure and just uh, cardiovert and use amiodarone and try and maintain sinus rhythm that way. There it is important to mention that 50% of the patients they have already had amiodarone before they were at least randomized or enrolled for the trial. Uh, that, that might bring you a couple of minutes or a couple of hours, uh, but the, the patients, were, they would get recurrence, recurrence. And it was very interesting also, and uh, this is in line with the data from, from Jason and Rada, he demonstrated that we also, were, that we were able to reduce the percentage of persistent AFib patients to paroxysmal. So we did a downstaging of the underlying disease, and this is not able with, uh, with cardioversion or other uh, or drugs, for example. But I really like about that question and that comment, um, the idea that obviously rhythm control in this subset of patients obviously gets a role and gets an importance, you know, like, and if it may be a cardioversion initially, giving amiodarone if they didn't have that before, and you can keep the patient in sinus rhythm with this, therapy, I think we are, we are reaching the same goal. I think the critical point is to get into the mind of heart failure uh, patient treating physicians that sinus rhythm is beneficial, however you will get there. But maybe ablation, of course, as in other studies, is the most powerful tool to reach that. 
but also a cardioversion can be a really good thing to do. You just have to think about it and consider it. I do want to say to everybody that there is a tension sometimes between the heart failure community and the EP community. And I think the ideal situation is that we won't work together because I think that we can help uh, with helping the maintenance of sinus rhythm. The control group mortality at one year was 20%. And I've heard people say that that's not advanced heart failure, that advanced heart failure patients have much higher mortality than that. And so maybe uh, this person who, who is a heart failure specialist was criticizing maybe a selection bias and picking like the best patients. So How would you answer that? There is data available from Eurotransplant, for example, that the waiting list mortality is 18%. So I think we are almost in line with this, uh, with this 20% of mortality in this conservative group. Um, but I mean, you cannot generalize it. I mean, all these patients have different histories. We have 60% DCM and 40% and uh, ICM. So, but, but I think it is a very representative group. Yeah. In, in contrast to your friend who suggested it, it's not. <laughs> and what I really like about the discussion is that some approach us and saying the, the mortality in the control group is much too high. You know, like, what are you doing with those patients? You create so many endpoints. And the other ones say it's not high enough because then it's not end-stage heart failure. So mm -hmm. come on. We have a patient uh, cohort which is very well described, very well characterized. If the name, the label is end-stage heart failure, advanced heart failure, whatever, they are sicker than the ones that we had before in our trials. Those patients that we treated were mostly excluded from all other trials. We opened a door, we found a clear result, and I think everyone can like see whatever he likes to see or her. What would your take home message be uh after having done this trial, designed this trial, conducted it in your single center and come up with these amazing results, what, what would your message be to, to the whole community? Yeah, taking into consideration how severely sick these patients are, I can just repeat it, they are one step away from death more or less or from surgical intervention that can prolong their life. You should also consider that there are options like AF ablation who can bring time, who can gain time, whatever, who can postpone the natural cause, as he said, or even in some patients replace this destination therapy as we mentioned and therefore um, I, I recommend to the to the next guidelines that every patient should carefully be checked for sinus rhythm before bringing these patients into the environment of transplantation yeah and my interpretation is that we have to try to bring into people's mind the physician's mind that besides a well established and well documented effect of, of drug therapy with Fabulous four, we may now have the fabulous five, including an uh, ablation option for AF patients. Excellent, excellent. I also want to just say before we close, congratulations on Christian Solms, Philip Sommer, for doing a randomized controlled trial to, to answer a question. This is the way forward, I think, to answer uncertainties in medicine. So I'm really ex excited to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you.